Okay. So we should probably just just check back and revise what we already know about Kutubot. And the best place to do that is the Mishneh Torah. And the Maimonides says that before entering into a chuppah, a person, a man, actually has to write a marriage contract for his wife. He has to, by the way, he has to pay the price of the scribe for writing the contract. And if she's a virgin, the price is not less than 200 dinarim. If she's not a virgin, it's no less than 100. And the sage is this is a, the this is the money that she will receive if if he dies, or if she's divorced. In other words, this is her financial security. In the event that he's no longer around, that's it's not the price of the bride; it's the amount of money he puts down to assure her financial security. And the Rambam says, Maimonides says, hem isha. the sages ordained the requirement of a ketuba for a wife, so that it wouldn't be because it wouldn't be a casual thing for people to carry out divorce. You know, divorce is a serious thing and it's got financial consequences. And, you know, this is a lot of money, whether it's 100 or 200, Dinarim, it's it's a lot of you know it's it's a lot of money. People don't divorce casually, and the Rambam goes on to say, is forbidden to, for a man to stay with his wife even a single hour without a ketuba. So this is really a big deal, and there's a differential amount for widows and for virgins and we we speculated that, that you know there might be good economic reasons there that possibly a widow has already received the ketubah from her first husband and possibly the rabbis want to make if you like an economic incentive to marry widows so they set if you like the level of the ketubah lower than it might otherwise they set the level of the ketubah lower. And we we learned that um, we, we closed, actually, on the fourth Mishnah of the chapter, um, that betula almana gru shavachalutsa mina nisuin, a virgin, someone who is physically a virgin, but she's already married. So maybe you know she maybe the marriage hasn't been consummated. She has been married, but the marriage is not consummated. Butula, and she's an almana, she's a widow, or grusha, maybe she's divorced, or chalutsa maybe she's um uh maybe she's a chalutsa. So her um, husband died childless, and she gave um chalitza to her brother-in-law. Ketubatan money, their ketubah is a money. In other words, a hundred, so it's a hundred dinarim. Ve'ein lahenta, not betulim. There's no claim of non-virginity upon her. We we close on this Mishnah. So the Mishnah seems to focus on, it seems to assume, that the Mishnah doesn't investigate physical virginity. It assumes that someone who's already been married is not a virgin, or at least for the purpose of the ketubah, the someone who's already been married receives a lower uh, a lower sum of money in her ketubah. And similarly, if there's a presumption that she may have been raped or abused, so hagyoret v'hashfuya a convert or a captive or a slave, sheniftu or shenit or shenit gayru or shenishtachachu yeterot al benot shalosh shanim v'yom echad, if they've been redeemed or converted or free when they're more than three years old, then Ketubatan money, their ketubah is a money, in other words, a hundred zuz. You can't make a claim of non virginity. And we, we covered this when we essentially before the break. So the Mishnah then goes on to another kind of claim of non virginity, which gives us a really interesting insight actually into real practical marriage customs in the time of the Mishnah. 
Ha'ochel etzel chamav bihuda, someone who eats with his father-in-law in Judah, in Yehuda, in the province of Judah, shelo of Edim, without witnesses. So he he's staying with his father-in-law. Obviously, in his bride's house, his bride's obviously there. He can't raise a claim of non virginity against his wife because he's been alone with her. Now, what is going on here? And the Bartonur is actually going to explain. The, and the Bartonur gives us a fantastic explanation. He who eats with his father in law in Judah, what are we talking about here? So the Bartonur says, when they were making the betrothal celebration in the house of the bride's father in Judea. Now, remember, in those days, the betrothal and the marriage were, might be, you know, as much as a year apart, because after the betrothal, the husband would have to basically work or transact or arrange to get a hold of the money necessary to perform the marriage. So today we do kiddushin and, and erusin, uh, we keep kiddushin and, and nisuin on the same day, at the same instant. We do it all under the chuppah. But in those days, the kiddushin was a was a long, long time before. So the Bartanur is talking about the betrothal feast when the couple are not yet married. Now. When they're not yet married, according to um, the plain halacha, they should not yet be living together or be intimate together. But it seems to be different in Yehuda. So let's carry on reading the Bartanur. So they're making the betrothal celebration in, in the house of the bride's father in Judea. It was a practice that the fiancé would be alone with his fiancé, in order that his heart, well, libogas means his heart should grow, but it, it, it has a, it's got a slight, I, I've translated this literally, but it's an expression that has a, it's, it's a rude tone. It's a, it's a rude expression. It's not a pleasant expression, actually, but there's clear sexual implication. There's a clear sexual implication here. And so this would happen essentially when he was sitting, when he was in his father-in-law's house right after the betrothal. When she gets married after that, so a few months after that, they'll have the nisuin. Ain law tanat p'tulim. He can't make a claim of non-virginity because the assumption is that he they've had a sexual relationship before, but after betrothal, but before marriage. And that's essentially what the Mishnah summarizes it, if you like, very compactly. Someone who eats with his father-in-law in Judah without witnesses, he can't raise a claim of non-virginity. And then the Mishnah is now going to segue to the question of we've talked about virgins and widows. What about a what about um what about someone from a priestly family? And there is clearly going to be a and we've seen before there's this tension in the Mishnah between you know, do the priests have extra rights or not? And Sometimes there's, well, sometimes there's stress, if you like, in, in those, in, in, there's stress along those lines. And of course, the Mishnah is codified 100, probably 130 years after the temple's no longer going. But the some of the voices in the Mishnah are older. And of course, that tension still is still there. Now, and we're going to rule both for and against the priests now. So we'll see that tension play out in both directions. Both Israelite and priestly widows have a ketubah that is a, is a money, in other words, a hundreds of us. So they have the same level of ketubah. But, 
of a tzula, arba me'el zuz. But the court of the priests used to collect for a virgin 400 zuz. That's 400 dinars. Ve'lo mechu biyadam chachamem. And the sages did not protest. Now, remember, the ordinary ketubah for a virgin is 200. So the court of the Kohanim seems to be collecting 400 for a virgin who comes from a priestly family. And the sages seem to be going along with it. Lo mechu biyadam chachamem. 